Hello, and welcome to Game Gems. Today, we're going to talk about vectors, what they are, what they're for, and how, slash why, we use them in game development. All the information in this video is pulled from the Godot documentation sections on vector math, but let's be honest, nobody ever reads that stuff. Even so, I'll drop a link in the description below in case you want to prove me wrong. Do it. It'll make you a better person. A lot of amateur developers look at vectors as akin to black magic. They know that if they make one and call it speed and give it to their character body 2D node, uh, then it does things. But that's about the extent of it. Understanding vectors is essential to attempting to do anything productive in game development, especially in today's engines. Vectors are, as an animated supervillain once so eloquently put it, a quantity represented by an arrow with both direction and magnitude. Whoa, too nerdy. Let's dial that back a bit and start from the beginning. All modern game engines represent an object's position with what's known as the Cartesian coordinate system, which uses two, or three in the case of 3D, numbers to define the object's alignment along two, or three axes, relative to the origin. And before I continue, I'm going to limit all examples in this video to 2D only, because it's easier for beginners to conceptualize. The math works out the same for 3D coordinates as well, there's just an extra value involved. In Godot, this is represented by a node's transform property, specifically its position. The position property contains two values, x and y. x represents an object's horizontal, that is, the left-to-right position, and y represents its up-down position. One thing to note, though, when dealing in pixel coordinates is up is down and down is up. Therefore, a positive value in the y direction will actually move the object downward. This is the only difference between 2D and 3D, and is purely visual. It doesn't affect our calculations at all. Another thing to note is that every object in your game exists in what's called world space, which is the global Cartesian coordinate system representing your game world. However, each object also has its own local coordinate space. You work with this local space all the time when creating scenes like your player character. You create a new scene and align the child nodes to the origin of the parent, which is your player. For example, if I had a character body 2D and wanted to add a sprite 2D to it, unless I changed the sprite 2D's position property, it would be located at the character body 2D's origin, which is of course 0, 0 in local space. If I then move the 2D sprite over 5 pixels, it's now at 5, 0 locally. But if we go back to our world coordinate space and move the character body 2D to position 10, 0, the sprite's local position remains at 5, 0, but its world coordinate position is now 15, 0, because the local coordinates of an object describe the object's position relative to that parent. To get an object's world coordinates then, we simply add its parent's world coordinates to its own local position, a process known as translation. Translation, along with rotation and scaling, is what makes up the grid known as the transformation matrix. We won't be talking about that in this video, but if there's enough demand, maybe I'll cover that topic in the future. Leave a comment below if you'd like to see it. Anyway, the reason I mention all of this is because vectors can be positioned at any point in local or world space, much like any other object. However, when discussing vector concepts, we usually simplify things by treating them as though they're originating from, well, the origin of their local space. Now, at this point, you might be saying to yourself, hey, wait a minute. You said a vector was an arrow. Raycasts are arrows. Are raycasts vectors? Yes. Yes, they are. A lot of other things are also vectors, though. Focus. One of the properties of that raycast 2D is the target position. This is the position in local space that the vector, that is the arrow, is pointing at, the direction of the vector. This pair of coordinates is the set of values you pass in when you create a new vector 2 by way of the new operator, by the way. All vectors in Godot are assumed to be starting at the origin, so we don't provide or store their global offset. And that's it. You now know everything there is to know about vectors. Don't forget to like and subscribe. <laughs> just kidding. We're only just getting started. Now that you know how a vector is defined, there are a lot of things you can do with them. The first thing you can do with a vector is to get its length, also known as its magnitude. Hey, that supervillain guy wasn't just spouting gibberish after all, was he? In mathematics land, we would use the Pythagorean theorem to calculate the length of the vector, which is the hypotenuse of a right triangle. But the Godot developers were gracious enough to give us a method to do that for us, and it's called, appropriately enough, length. In fact, the Vector2 and Vector3 classes have functions to automatically calculate all the stuff I'm going to cover, so we don't have to delve into the math behind the concepts. We can just look at their practical applications. Lucky us. A vector with a length of 1 is known as a unit vector. Unit vectors are useful if you want a simple vector that hasn't been messed with in any way. They form the basis of more complex vectors, so to speak. And when you use the built-in vector constants, up, down, left, or right, you're using unit vectors. Note, however, that these vectors only have a length of 1 because only one of their coordinates is 1. A vector with both coordinates equal to 1 is not a unit vector, and this error is such a common gotcha that I wish I had a dollar for every time I was asked about it during a job interview. Converting a larger vector into a unit vector is called normalizing the vector and is done by way of the normalized method. 
Changing the length of a vector is known as scaling the vector and is done appropriately enough with a value called a scalar. A scalar is simply a float, but we give it a fancy name. Multiply both coordinate values of the vector by this float and the deed is done. If we learn one more thing, we can start pushing a sprite around, that being how to add vectors to one another. Adding vectors is pretty easy. When you add two vectors, all you do is add both components of each vector to one another. That is, you add the x component of the first vector to the x component of the second vector, and do likewise to the y components. And obviously, if you're working in 3D, you do likewise again for the z component. I told you the math was the same. Godot abstracts all of this away though, so just use the plus sign and Bob's your uncle, as my friends across the pond would say. Now that we're masters of basic vector manipulations, let's look at the most common use case, moving the player around. How often have you just copy pasted code like this from some platformer tutorial without bothering to understand the math behind it? If you're watching this video, the answer is probably more than once. It's okay, I won't tell anyone. First step to rehabilitation is admitting you have a problem. Create a new scene and add a Sprite2D to it. Like your forefathers before you, set the sprite's texture to our old friend icon.svg. Attach a script to this Sprite2D and ideally make sure you're using the original template so that it defines the ready and process methods for you. First thing we'll do is define a variable called velocity. If you're familiar with the character body 2D or 3D nodes, You'll note that this variable comes packaged as part of their existing properties. What we're doing here is what Godot does under the hood to make those nodes work. Character body nodes basically reproduce this process, but add in more complex behaviors like collision, sliding, floor checks, physics calculations, and so forth. We won't be doing that. Okay, so we have a sprite with a velocity. Now what? Well, let's make our sprite move up. In the ready function, or in the process function, it doesn't matter which, set your velocity variable equal to vector.up. Vector.up, as previously stated, is a unit vector that represents the direction up, which means that x is zero, so there's no left or right movement, and y is negative one. Before we move on though, if you're working in 3D, note that due to the flipped axis that the y value of vector three up is one, not negative one. Now let's go into our process method. Also, as previously stated, a node's position is a vector, and the velocity is a vector, and we can add vectors, so you make your sprite move by adding the velocity to the position, like so. Since the process is called every frame, that means that every frame, the sprite will get its current position modified by the velocity resulting in movement. Run your scene and see it in action. Mathematically speaking, here's what happens. The process method runs at roughly 60 frames per second. You can verify this by printing out the delta variable and comparing it to the value you get dividing one by 60 with a calculator. It's the total time elapsed between calls to this method. Add up 60 frames worth of these values and you should get a value very close to one. Every frame, Godot is taking the velocity vector and adding it to the position vector, which means that the position vector is having its y value modified by negative one. As a result, the sprite moves upward roughly 60 pixels in one second, which you can verify by seeing that the sprite takes about a second to move off screen since the Godot logo is 128 pixels by 128 pixels in size. Thing is though, that not all hardware is created equal. Godot tries to run at 60 frames a second, but this isn't always possible. So if you simply rely on the frame rate to enforce your character's movement speed to be 60 pixels per second, you're gonna have a bad time. With a frame rate of 20, for example, the character would only move 20 pixels in that same time frame. So how do we fix this? We scale the character's movement, of course. The delta variable passed into the process function is a float representing how much time has passed since the last frame. Floats are scalars, and we can use scalars to modify the length of our velocity vector by multiplying the two of them together. Hold on though, now the player is moving at a crawl. Why is that? Well, what we did was shorten the velocity vector so that it was no longer negative one. It's the value of delta. And since if you add up 60 frames worth of delta values, they equal one, now we're moving our character one pixel per second. Boring. Fortunately, we can fix that by providing a scalar to represent the player's desired speed in pixels per second. And if we multiply our velocity vector by that vector and then scale it by delta, we have exactly what we need. Congratulations. Now you know what's going on under the hood when you move sprites around. Let's flex our newfound knowledge and write an input handler to move our player in the eight cardinal compass directions. Let's delete our velocity variable and create a local declaration in process. We'll assign that variable the return value of the method getVelocity and then scale it by the desired speed as usual. GetVelocity needs to return a normalized vector that's a combination of all of the directional keys the user is pressing because we want it to handle diagonals as well as left, right, up, and down. We start by initializing a new velocity with vector 2.0, which, as you may guess, is a vector with both x and y components set to zero. We do this so the velocity is effectively reset every frame, which means if the user has released all the buttons, then the player sprite stops moving. All we have to do is check if each action is pressed, which we can do in the usual way. If it is, we add the relevant directional vector to our velocity. Wait a minute though, 
Because if you recall, I mentioned that a vector with values in both x and y directions is not a unit vector, and if we're moving on the diagonal, that's exactly what we have. We nearly made that very common mistake. Naturally, we fix it by returning the normalized vector, not the vector itself. If you didn't do this, then the player would actually move faster along diagonals than they would normally. Remove the normalized call if you'd like to see that for yourself. And that's it. Movement. Yes, it's the same movement you've done a million times before, but now you know why it works, and that's the important part. Vectors are a complex topic, and we are far from done, but I'm going to leave the rest for part two and beyond. If you want to see part two, or beyond, drop me a like, post me a comment, and of course subscribe to this channel for more game gems. See you next time.